welcome to today's RUC People, and I'm very pleased to be joined by Dr. Greg Simpson, who um, I think is known to some of us here at RUC, been coming along for a few years now with his family. So great to have you here today, Greg. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you, Russell. Great to be here. Cool. So Greg, tell us a little bit about what you do with yourself during the day um, and uh, your professional life. I think uh, it's going to be very interesting to hear. Um, yeah, it's, um, it's hard to put actually my day into a box. <laughs> um, uh, sometimes I wish it was more in a box. Um, <laughs> sure. And other days uh, I wake up and I try and work out what hat I'm putting in. Um, but uh, I train as a vet, <clears throat> but I've done a few different things along the way. And now I'm actually setting up a wildlife forensic academy up the west coast, so it's an hour from here on mm -hmm. a nature reserve. And I'm sure you know this church is quite environmentally focused, and we know about the threats uh, to animals through poaching, illegal trade, and and mm -hmm. and other crimes. Not only animals, actually plants included. And so we decided. I've, I've got a partner, and we are setting a facility up where people can come and get training specifically around a crime scene so they'll it's like how to process a crime scene how not to mess up the forensic traces how to collect the traces how to uh, photograph the scene or so it's quite yeah some quite technical but also some quite broad and what we're actually doing is creating a big shed with we're going to have a dead rhino that's been shot we're going to have a lion that's been snared and a giraffe and vultures that have been poisoned or um I'm caught in some way and we in a way it's going to be a little bit like a movie set so you're going to go in and then you can do quite a few crime scenes in a short space of time and you can do quite focused training uh, and so that's a really busy building and there isn't actually one like it in the world so that's quite exciting that, that training does occur in the world but not 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 in in the same level fantastic I mean it's um, an interesting journey from starting as a vet, like uh, you started working as a veterinary surgeon in, in uh, like a few years ago, I assume. Yeah. How did we evolve from that into what you're doing now? That sounds very interesting. Um, yeah, I was fortunate to get into uh, Ornest Put, Pretoria, so I studied there and then after spending a lot of years in Pretoria, I really needed to move around, so mm. I went to the UK and um, I worked there and the nice thing about the UK is it's very close to lots of other countries and it's easy to move around so I did mm. some interesting traveling and what were you doing in the UK oh, sorry I was working as a vet mm. and mainly small animals but then I did mixed and I made a bit of a point to like a lot of South Africans go and they <clears throat> stick together so I was like no I'm gonna go work in the country and I obviously I mean I kept my friends and so forth but I made a point of going and actually going to different trying to get into experience the culture a bit and and, mm. and and meet people out of my out of my comfort zone I guess and I uh, went to a wide variety of churches actually and then yeah I got a good work in Northern Ireland which was really interesting and I mean it, it was actually amazing the whole Catholic Protestant thing you know coming mm. from South Africa we don't really didn't really see a difference mm. in all Christians and then you go there and there's this this history and how antagonism and it was bizarre for me you would drive through one village and they would have the colors painted like the, the irish flag and it's catholic and then you go to the next village and it's got the uk colors mm. and it's protestant and anyway very interesting and also they would speak english to me and i, I wouldn't understand <laughs> half the, what the farmer was saying <laughs> yes uh, uh, selena and i are about to go and see the movie called belfast and i was reading a review that uh, said you you need subtitles for some of it because yeah, yeah, the yeah. accent's so thick you can't yeah. understand <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, so I had the stint in the UK, and then what happened after that? Then, uh, actually, when I was in Ireland, I went to a talk by an organisation called InterServe, um, which is a sort of a Christian development organisation, and there was a guy there talking, and he talked about uh, Kyrgyzstan. They were doing work, mm. in, in they were sending in medics and they, mm. and teachers to Kyrgyzstan. I was like, wow. I haven't heard of that country ever. I want to go there. <laughs> so, so then I went to Kyrgyzstan and I did, in, they wanted to know where they could send in, in vets. So I, 
I went around the country just interviewing and trying to find out the situation. So it was like a situational analysis. What's mm. the story and what is their position? And a very interesting country, poor but educated. Mm. They actually had two veterinary schools for a population of five million at the time. And yeah, really 97% uh, literacy. So educated, but the vets were earning $10 a month and they were doing other things. Uh, I made friends with a guy who was actually managing a museum and he, he was a vet, but he was earning more managing the museum than sure. as a vet. But yeah, and they were, they were trying to understand the whole shift from mm. communism to capitalism, basically. And it was a real big mind shift for them. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And democracy too, actually. So Kyrgyzstan, but then, as I say, I'm interested in this journey from being uh, a vet to doing this exciting project you're involved with right now. Uh, yeah, then I, I did a master's in public health in London mm. um, because I wanted to get into relief and development work and there wasn't a lot going on in the veterinary field, or I thought. So I thought, well, let me go on the human side. Mm. So I did that, and that's actually where I met Catherine, who uh, is my wife, is also mm. uh, was doing a, well, doing a master's. And, but then I find it quite difficult as a vet going in there uh, because a lot of organizations didn't know what to do with me really. Uh, I wasn't a logistician, I wasn't a medic, I was, <clears throat> and uh, I nearly actually went to Afghanistan. Um, and then my grandmother got very ill and I decided I was gonna stay with her and spend some time with her, uh, which is probably a good thing because the hotel I was meant to be at got bombed uh, a week before. Well. Before I was meant to get there, so <laughs> probably was a good thing. <laughs> so when you say the grandmother got ill, that meant coming back to Cape Town. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I was actually here, yeah, but I was mm. uh, spending quite a lot of time with her, so I just I realised her time was limited, mm. so I would spend more time with her. Maybe it was I was chickening out, possibly going to Afghanistan. <laughs> I don't know. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then, sorry, I haven't answered your question. Um, <laughs> Then I also, you know, I, I did some actually some HIV work. I uh, was working for an, uh, an NGO uh, looking at capacity in HIV after that master's. Mm. And then I realized that actually I really like animals and uh, I like I mean, particularly wildlife. <clears throat> so I then did a, a wildlife management master's uh, through Pretoria. Uh, and I then after that I like I thought oh I like research actually I like finding out things and and I've got this health degree and another health degree and I want to go and look at humans and and wildlife and um, health and so forth and how they all kind of fit together so I went to Mozambique and there's a park called Limpopo National Park and that was in that would have been 2000 and you know, I don't know, late uh, 2000 and something. Um, and I went and walked around and chatted to people and hired a translator and, and asked people about their problems with wildlife and uh, you know the damage that they, that they do to their crops and then also looking at the health aspects. So I did a bit of research there. And then while I was there, I connected with a University of Pretoria uh, lecturer <clears throat> and he said, well, are we starting up a clinic just outside Kruger to train students to work in the community. Mm. Um, will you, can you start it up for me? So I said, that sounds really interesting. Um, so I did. So we started up this clinic and every two weeks I'd get students from Pretoria and abroad. And it was really just to train them to work in a context where they had limited resources. Mm. Uh, they have to kind of really, you know, think with their, their hands and their, and, and then the heads. And they had to also, learn to work with different cultures and communities and understand community structures um, and so forth. And so I set that up and what was quite nice is because I'd done this public health, I brought in Vits, Vits uh, sent their uh, public health students to the area and so mm. I created a, a bit of a, a link and, and the veterinary students would go and spend time at the clinic mm. uh, and the, the the medical students would tell them about their problems, you know, HIV, TB, et cetera. Mm. And then the medical students would come and hang out. We would go to a dip tank every morning where they they dip the cattle. Mm. <clears throat> and uh, then we'd get the medical students to listen to a cow's heart and or, or put a thermometer in, in the bum or whatever. And it was quite a con uh, conceptualization for them because I think humans are seen as like something separate, mm. uh, maybe godly, I don't know, but <laughs> we're not the, almost not an animal. <laughs> and it was a bit of a, a mind shift for the medical students to realize actually the link is, is you know, is, is really close. The physiology is, 
is very you know almost the same. Um, so that that was quite fun seeing seeing you know the, those different students um, mm -hmm. have these realizations. And I, for me, teaching is the best part is the realizations. Like a student say, "Wow, this is amazing! I can do this, mm. or I understand this, or I see this." The lights go on. Yeah, the lights go on. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but while I was there, the poaching started increasing mainly in, in rhinos, and uh, we would get asked to come in and help, mainly because we'd have to cut them up to find the bullets or work on mm. why they died. So, because mm. a rhino could have just died and someone hacked the horn off. But if you can say the rhino actually died because someone shot it and then the horn was hacked off, it's a different crime um, as opposed to just. You know, if you're actually killing the animal, stealing the horn, if you, you know, as opposed to just stealing the horn. And also you want to try to find the bullet because the bullet is uh, a, a trace that can be linked to a gun. And then a gun could possibly be linked to a person. So I started getting involved with those and I met a man who wanted to set up uh, a wildlife forensic training facility. And we looked at doing it up there and it didn't work. Uh, and then we said, well, why don't, we do it up here because there's the marine side, which mm. we know mainly through Abalone is, mm. is quite important. Um, so we're just setting it up here and hopefully we'll open in a few months. Mm. Whereabouts exactly? Uh, it's at uh, Buffelsfontein Game and Nature Reserve, which is opposite the West Coast National Park. Oh, fantastic. Going there tomorrow. I have to check it out. But uh, yeah. <laughs> So is there a new uh, sort of TV series coming out so, soon? You know, CSI, uh, song? Maybe. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> CSI Kruger or something, you know. <laughs> maybe. I think there's a gap for that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah definitely. <laughs> well, it's a very interesting, Greg. Um, and uh, is this sort of uh, a whole new entrepreneurial thing? You know, you have to, you have to, you know, leave the, the secure income of being a vet to, you know, almost start a business and, and, and yeah. get this thing up and running, you know, that must be sort of exciting and stressful and all at the same time. Yeah, it is. <laughs> In short. <laughs> um, I think what I, I like education, I like conservation. Uh, I do like starting things up. I, I'm mm. more of a a uh, starter than a manager, I think. I think that's more my strong suit. Um, mm. I also find when working for a big organization, a, a parastatal organization, I find it a bit risk averse and it was mm. hard to sort of build uh, and create. Um, mm. And so I thought, well, this, this, this could be fun um, mm. and hopefully will be successful and, and make a difference. And I think w one of the benefits of being a sort of private organization or a small organization is we can partner with whoever we want and we're mm. quite flexible so we can, mm. you know, move and change, mm. which I uh, don't know if it's always the case with other organizations. And has this attracted sort of international interest as well? It has actually, yeah. We've initially linked with the University of Florida and they have a wildlife forensic master's course so they were mm. quite keen to come and send the students and help with building curriculum mm. um, and we're linking with organizations uh, doing stuff in this country um, environmental organizations and obviously there's a lot of experience um, in, in this country um, we've also got some interest from um, other NGOs overseas or, or, or international NGOs um, yeah I think it has we probably started a bit uh, low key until we <clears throat> get our feet. You know, with COVID, we weren't you know, mm. sure when exactly you are going to start and what's going to happen, and can mm. you get metal or can you not get metal, and mm. what's the price going to be? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, but we're getting closer, and I think we're going to start marketing a bit harder, probably. Great. Well, anyway, take us back a few years before that. Uh, you know, where did it all start for you? Where, where, where were you born? Where did you grow up? Uh, tell us a bit about your family. Sure. Um, I grew up in Hart Bay, uh, so I was born down the road mm. in Mowbray, grew up in Hart Bay, and yeah, it was a great upbringing. We used to catch a bus. Well, I, used, I went to school there, and then I actually came to school here at Bishops later on, and we used to catch a bus with all the school kids uh, mm. through all the past, all the different schools on the way here, and mm. it, was, it was quite social. Mm. And then occasionally we'd cycle to school, and um, uh, yeah, so I was fortunate to be close to the sea, close to the mountains. Um, Big family? Uh, three, four boys. 
four so boys. Fairly big, yes. Where are you in the pecking order? Three. Number three out of yeah. four. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and your parents? Uh, tell us a bit about them. Sure. My mother um, was the daughter of a major general. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but she she uh, did a BA, then became a librarian actually, and actually worked here in Ronald Bosch uh, Library for a while. And um, then studied horticulture later on in her 60s mm. and uh, w went into horticultural journalism. So she'd write for quite a variety of magazines and is pretty good in the garden. And my father um, uh, took over from his father and went into stockbroking and then later on uh, took over a farm that my grandfather had. So he, mm. he had, yeah. Mm. I think he probably would have liked to have gone into architecture or something, but he, uh, yeah, he made up for it. Okay. And how were the, the school years? Uh, the school years were good, yeah. I enjoyed my school years. I think I was happy to leave at the end, uh, as you probably are, 18. Um, yeah, I was very, yeah. I had a, I had a great, great school I, um, and I made some amazing friends that I'm actually still friends with. Mm. Um, school's not without its issues, but uh, yeah. yeah. And were you a good student? I think so, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I only got cane once, I think. So that was... <laughs> and were you, were you into the sport and other sort of, you know, bishops' activities? I was, but I'm not that, yeah, I was, but I'm probably not as competitive as I could be. So it was right. more like the fun and play yeah. games and everyone, let everyone win, you know, kind of thing. Okay. As opposed to trying to be the person coming first. Sure. Um, but, yeah. And tell me, where did the interest in being a vet start? You know, what, were you always loving animals? Did you have animals in the, in the house as a kid? Uh, you know, where did this come from? Good question. Uh, I think we had a bit of space where we were living and we had some animals. And my mother liked animals. So we had chickens and, uh, and we always had dogs and cats and, um, and rabbits at one stage. And, <laughs> That's quite a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I think she was a good influence and I just, I didn't really want to be in an office. I didn't really want to be in a hospital. Um, I like sort of the, I think there was an adventurous romantic side to it, um, that you dream. <clears throat> and I think that attracted me to it. Uh, so yeah. I mean, I guess a lot of kids growing up can think we love animals, but they don't necessarily want to be a vet, you know, that, so that's a, you know, I, I, maybe you're doing well at school, good at maths and science and stuff, so you could qualify for, for vet school. So, so was, was that a you know an obvious decision for you? Did you wrestle with other possible careers or say no? I, I, I did. Yeah, I mean, my parents. I think in in those days they sent me to a career person, and he you know yeah. did a few tests and, mm -hmm. and and said this is probably a good direction for him. Um, and I think. Growing up, we kind of didn't understand the vastness of, you're right, if you like animals, there is a vast, actually, array of careers that you can get into. But I yeah. think sort of in those days, it was more, more uh, less um, boxes. Um, whereas now you can get into conservation and, you know, yeah. or, or a variety of things. Um, yeah, and I think I was reasonable in, in, in school, so we took that path. Mm. So when did you go to study? I did a year here at UCT, BSc, and then I got in to vet because I didn't get in from school. And then I actually did, uh, and then I got in to Pretoria. To Pretoria? Oh, yeah. So first time out of the Western Cape, moving to, to study in Pretoria? Yeah. How was that? <clears throat> uh, it was hard, actually. <laughs> uh, it was actually, looking back, I think it was a bit traumatic. I had a little golf. And I remember driving, you know, they had these, you know, the maps, we had the map studio maps, and I just remember getting on this thing and driving, and then, you know, I have no idea really where I was going, just follow the N1 <laughs> and stop in the Karoo somewhere, spend the night, left the girlfriend, the family behind, and those, you know, that was pre internet, pre cell phone, pre <clears throat> all sorts of things. Um, yeah, so it was, uh, it was quite a, but it was an exciting adventure, and, you know, I think at that age, it was like, wow, this is. Right. Independent, mm. off we go. So, yeah. so did the the vet course at Pretoria? And how long is that? Uh, it's six years, five and a half. Sure. Yeah. So it's a long stint at at, at yeah. university. Yeah. And were you staying in Rays or? Um... 
I actually, for the first year, I stayed with my brother because I had some overlap from the BSC mm -hmm. I did here, <clears throat> of the first year, and in Johannesburg, which uh, I spent a lot of time waitering, uh, <laughs> and that, that was uh, that was good fun, um, some of it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and then I stayed in residence, which is great because it it forces you together with a variety of other people, and because I lived so, all well, my family lived so far away, I had to. Yeah. Now, I couldn't go away on weekends or whatever. You just have to be there and, and make yeah. friends. And, 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 and we did a lot of activities together. And, yeah, yeah it was we – we actually had a lot of fun. I think we were very fortunate to yeah. have had the amount of uh, fun. It, it was sort of a work hard, play hard environment, I think. So we worked hard for Thursday, and then all our tests would be on a Thursday, which was great. And then you <laughs> you relax for two days, and then you start again. <clears throat> yeah. Fine. Fine, fantastic. So, um, when you graduated from vet school, where, where did you go then? Did you come back to Cape Town or did you get a job in Pretoria? Uh, no, I went straight to the UK. So, that's oh. when I was a small animal vet, yeah. Went oh, I straight see. to the UK. So, I mean, how did you see that up? It's not every graduate from Pretoria says, okay, I'm going to go off to the UK. That's, a, that's, a, that's also a very big move, you know. Yeah, sure. Um, how did that come about? And that's a good question. I don't know. I, there were, I think there were quite a few people doing it. And, the, you know, the pound is strong. Uh, I had some debts. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and in those days, uh, yeah, the, the, we were in demand. Um, so we could go and get a job quite easily. And, in mm. fact, I remember going... Uh, and I, yeah, I, had, I remember going and getting onto a tube. And it cost me 50 rand to go from one stop, basically, you know, a few stops down... Because <laughs> I didn't have a job when I arrived, I just arrived. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I need a job really quickly. Because You're spending rounds, you're hemorrhaging. I know. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm not going to make it. And I, I actually just took the first job that I could find in East London, and it was, it was quite something there. We're using really archaic stuff, mm -hmm. um, and it was a bit of an experience. And they actually, they gave me a branch practice to run mine, so it was a new country. You know, the, everything, the drugs and everything got a different name or a different color. It's going to look at you. And I remember arriving my first day and there was a cube basically out of the door. And I was like, oh, my gosh. And then you arrive then. I learned very quickly that the first thing you do when you arrive is you open all the drawers and yeah. the fridges and everything. You just work out what's there and what you've got <laughs> so you can understand your parameters. And then <clears throat> off you go. So it was a bit of a baptism. So it was yeah. a kind of a, just a small practice. You were... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, all along... Were you sort of feeling validated that, yeah, this is the right choice for me? You know, people can go and study and think, oh, I'm not sure, you know, especially if you spend six years studying to be a, be a vet, you know, yeah. you, you would want at the end of that to think, yeah, actually, yeah, I really yeah. do want to do this. Was, was that true for you? Yeah, I think so. I mean, actually, when I was in third year of vet school, I applied for medicine because I thought vet might be too limited. Um, uh, uh, in terms, you know, medicine, there, there's more depth and I think there's more of a demand, you yeah. know, um, and I didn't get in. Um, and, uh, but I have realized that what's quite nice about veterinary science is you can actually move fairly easily. And, you know, you can work on a horse, you can work on a car, you could go and work on a zoo animal, you could, uh, you know, work on a fluffy. Um, and there's different things within that. You could look at eyes or you can go into medicine. So it is actually quite broad. The mm. value of your patient is not as, as high as a human. So mm. in, in, you know, in societal terms, and for many people, they are their mm. children, obviously. Um, so there are limitations, um, but it actually is, gives you quite a nice diversity and space which you've taken up with yes. going in different <clears throat> directions yeah. Yeah. you know doing some more study with, mm. with what you're ending up with now so really fascinating so tell us also about the the, the personal side of it so uh, you said uh, when you were studying in the UK that's when you met Catherine can you tell us a little bit more about that and how that you know you're now married kids back in Cape Town uh, yeah so uh, I thought she was quite interesting um, and we had some interests, uh, you know, at, at sort of the adventure side, faith. Um, and um, we headed off. Um, and 
it was a bit back and forth because she went back to America um, and uh, I went all over the place. And, um, and she was actually still studying at the time. Uh, so it took many years before we actually, she actually ended up then getting a job over here. And the kids came many years later. Mm. Okay. And for those who don't know Catherine, tell us a little bit more about what she does. Yeah, she's more interesting than me. <laughs> we'll, we'll get to her for the next interview. <laughs> Um, she's, uh, she studied, uh, well, she's a doctor, then studied surgery and uh, colorectal surgery and um, did a bit of that all over. She uh, ended up working for Médecins Sans Frontières, um, also around the world, doing some interesting stuff. Then she wanted to get into research um, and she has done that. She was doing some research with... Uh, through the government uh, and with the University of Cape Town and now has moved in and started a unit for global surgery at um, University of Stellenbosch. Mm -hmm. So she still does a little bit of um, clinical work, but it's mainly research around access to surgery and um, you know trying to make it easier for people <clears throat> to get their surgical needs met, mm -hmm. basically. Well, I'll have to dig into that with, with yeah. her when we, we get to chat. Yeah. So Greg, I mean, it seems you had a very sort of entrepreneurial, adventurous sort of spirit right from the start. You also talked about how, you know, you had quite an interest in justice and, you know, doing something to, to make a difference for good. Um, can you maybe give a sense of where that came from? And, you know, did you come from a faith tradition? You know, were your parents, you know, part of church? Was church part of your life as you, you grew up? And was that an influence for you? Yeah, it's funny, you know, when you look at yourself, you don't actually see things mm. like, <clears throat> sorry, like other people see you, you know, so I don't, it's just you have your own filter. So you don't know if you're here or here or here on like, <laughs> sure. whatever the justice, I mean, there's people that are doing unbelievable stuff. Um, and I think I'm right down here. <laughs> um, but to, to answer your question, my father was quite ethical. Um, and he, he actually had sort of a, a different religion. Um, my mother was, uh, was Christian, but not very active. So we didn't have a very active... Uh, when you say your father had a different religion, what, what does that mean? No, I mean, he was, he, he was Christian by upbringing, but then he ended up sort of, uh, um, you know, going into something else that I think interested him, interested him more. Um, but because I went to bishops, I actually, you know, got quite a lot of Christianity and ended up getting confirmed there. And I think... Uh, that was m where the influence came from, mainly. And uh, I actually really enjoyed, we would go to chapel for 10 minutes or 15 minutes in the morning. And uh, <clears throat> it was actually quite fun. And you get like a message and mm. off you go and start your day mm. and uh, sing a few songs. And um, I think that was foundational for me, mm. um, you know, in terms, of, in, in terms of my faith. And you, you were linking it to the justice um, I guess that comes in there in some way. Um, yeah. Well, maybe that, that isn't linked for you, but I mean, you, I was interested, you were saying, you know, when you were doing your vet work, you, you, you still had sort of a, a public health interest somehow or a wanting to, to see this have a bigger impact rather than just the, the animal in front of you. <coughs> or that's how I interpreted what uh, you were saying. Yes. No, you're right. And I think these degrees, you... They're quite technical, yes. so you end up with quite special skills. Mm. But my interests are more like the bigger picture and how can you actually work on the bigger picture. Yes. And there's pros and cons to both, because once you step back, work on the bigger picture, then there's a whole of other people that come in and yes. there are things that are out of your control, whereas if you specialize, it's a lot more in your control in a way. Um, and I don't know if actually sort of my training prepared me for that. So I think I wanted to be in a bigger picture. So that's why I thought, well, let's do a, a more of yeah. a public health, which is a broader, yeah. bigger picture thing and, and uh, be more interesting as opposed to, I somehow, I haven't really been, a, I haven't become a good specialist, um, you know, or focused. <clears throat> you said you were a good starter and not necessarily <laughs> the manager, so you, on to the next thing. You know? Yeah, yeah. And I, I think, 
for, you know, people should think about that. And uh, I actually just listening to a book called Range, which is about exactly that, about uh, breadth and uh, mm. or, or or narrow, mm. and how this you know this pros and cons. Both understanding your own personality and what mm. you know what, what yeah. motivates you and keeps you. <laughs> yeah, but it, it is quite hard because well, it's quite hard. But you, you, you know, I feel a bit alone sometimes because. You know, I, I could, you could give me a, a house on the corner and say, okay, be a vet, and I could go and do that, no problem. And I'd fit into a box, and I'd, yeah. you know, I'd, I'd, and I'd fit in with other people in the similar things. But trying to do what I'm doing, no, it's, it doesn't really fit the box, and it's quite hard to, yeah, you know, it's a bit of a, it's hard to, you, you know, hard to. I don't know. <laughs> well, you could see your way forward in a way. It's like you are running but in you're the midst of it. But you're creating something. You're, yeah. you know, it's the nature of it. You, you, there isn't a roadmap, but it yeah. has, hasn't been done. So you're charting a new yeah. way, which is exciting in a, yeah. in a different way. I mean, you know, as I say, maybe also stressful and risky, but, you know, it's, yeah. it's exciting and, you know, it could really make a big difference. Sure. So, but I, I think the point is that that sort of I didn't I don't know that that is what would happen. Like, whereas when you're you're training and then so you okay, if you do this, you're going to feel like this, look like this. You know, it's not necessarily just a linear path <laughs> that you can yeah. predict. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, how did you find your way to this place to IUC? It's a good question. Um, we ended up sending our kids uh, to Marist uh, and then to, uh, yeah, next door. Um, but I think we were coming sort of before that. We moved to Ronneboy from the city. Um, and actually, I was in Pretoria at the time. Uh, mm. And then we sort of ended up moving here. So we down the road. Um, and we just, I think we just, I, I don't know if it was through referral or we just thought, well, let's give it a go. Um, I'm sure we probably asked around, uh, and we just came and I, we, we liked the mix. I, I quite, you know, I quite liked, actually went, we went to St. Andrews and I quite liked the Anglican cause that's what I'm used to. Um, <clears throat> Catherine's used to, you know, she, she um, different, uh, sort of more the United, um, way and we came and you just enjoyed it. And I think we like the. The people and the it's a bit cerebral the <laughs> the service and the, the community and so forth. That's um yeah. So it makes you think a bit and it's interesting people and interesting message. And I think it also the church also tries to be actively involved in the bigger picture as well. Yeah, you know, from a variety of things. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we sort of just, I think we ended up in the area, gave it a bash and really liked it. So, yeah. Still here, which is yeah. great. Yeah. And tell us about the kids. Um, when do they come and how's that been combining fatherhood, parenthood with everything else going on in your life? The kids, um, yeah, they came a while back. Uh, they actually, interestingly, first went to Rwanda for their first year of life. Um, mm -hmm. And they were born, sorry, born in America. And then they came down to the Cape, actually via Kruger, because I, I was in Kruger, so there was a lot of moving. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, that, yeah, and then we ended up moving. They went to four schools in four years at one stage. <clears throat> um, yeah, they've, they're, they're fantastic. How old are you? Kids they're now? nine, sorry, they're nine. So twins, twins, yeah. So mm -hmm. they're twins, um, and twins. I think is one and a half times the work, not double. So there is economies of there, scale there, where oh, there are economies of scale. Yeah, I always tell people <laughs> that about have twins. There are some economies of scale. You may not feel like it at the beginning, but later on the line, you'll see the benefits. And um, yeah, I remember when we were discussing one or two and. The, the benefit of two is they always have someone to play with or fight with. But and uh, <laughs> um, Kath and I have discussed over the years: is it like 
is it 50% fun and 50% work or is it 70? And so like it's changed <laughs> over the years. I think it's gone from, you know, 30% fun to now it's 70%, 80% mm. fun. Mm. So it's interesting to see the, the trend with mm. time. Um, yeah, they, they here in Cape Town and at, um, actually at, at Rustenburg and Bishops and enjoying it. Mm. And they, yeah. Uh, and two parents with very active careers. Uh, has that been a challenge? I think it's been okay. I don't, I don't think it's been uh, a, a major challenge. Uh, I mean, we have brought people in. Uh, mm. So we've had all pairs and we've had someone that actually now mm. lives uh, right next to us. So that's very helpful. Mm. Um, but because I've been setting up this academy, I've been quite flexible, actually. Mm. Uh, once it picks up, I think it's going to be a bit harder. Mm. Um, and then I, you know, and then we had COVID for two years. So, I mean, we were at home you know, a lot of the time, so it's a lot easier. Yeah. Um, well, I think it is a juggle. Uh, Catherine is uh, highly organized, so that's helpful. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it hasn't been as bad as I think as it could have been, yeah. Great. And Greg... What, is, what does fun look like for you? Do you have time for, for much of that beyond, you know, work and parenting? Uh, you know, what, what is it you like to do? I like spending time in nature. So for me, uh, I, get, I think I get a lot of mental health from <clears throat> generally, generally exercising in nature. So I'll go for a run in the mountain or I'll swim in the sea and, um, you know, we'll take the kids boogie boarding somewhere. Um, mm. And what's... Initially, I, I find Captain a bit boring uh, because I, I moved from Kruger and where I heard lions every second night and outside my house. Um, but there's actually so many other things here. And I connected with people that swim in Camps Bay, Clifton, that side. And it's really amazing community um, mm. that swim and enjoy nature and, and go out and tidal exercise. Pools, all the beach. No, a bit bigger than the tidal pool. Yeah. Um, and that's been, that's actually been, I really enjoy swimming and, you know, watching the sand and the kelp below you as you move along and mm. you see the odd animal mm. and that. Octopus. That, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that, that's, yeah, I, I find exercise and spending a bit of time in nature quite important for me from like mm. a mental well-being. Mm. Um, and I think it's a bit of time to sort of meditate and, and think about life and, of late, I've started listening to books. So when I run, I listen to books, and I also quite like that. Mm. Um, and um, yeah, we try to get the kids out too uh, into the forest, mm. um, and and that's that's really nice. Mm. Oh well, all very very interesting, Greg. And uh, you know, I was going to ask you about the future. You've talked a little bit about the academy being a big part of the you know the excitement there. Any other plans of interesting things on the horizon for you? Uh, I've got some ideas, yeah, but uh, um, they need time. Um, I did promise a friend of mine that we'd fly through Africa before we turned 50, so I'm running out of time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, I, we... Fly through Africa, what does that mean? No, I did a microlight. <laughs> pilot's license years ago and I haven't actually kept it up so <clears throat> right. need to get back into that um, and then we need to do that running out of time so that'll be quite fun mm. um, but to be honest no I, I, I have dreams and ideas but it's pretty short term we're focused at the moment yeah. right. okay well thank you so much for being here today and uh, telling us a little bit more about uh, what you've been up to and uh, yeah we will follow your latest venture with interest that sounds fascinating i hope we can uh, stay in touch thanks thank you Russell. thanks for the conversation thanks Greg. cheers ciao